I would like to welcome to the stage our second speaker, Whitney, who will talk about the first pop star in the history of pop music. Is that correct? Sort of. Sort of. Sort of. So please give a massive round of applause to Whitney. Great, thank you so much. I was delighted to find I'm not the only American on the program tonight. I came here from Madison, Wisconsin, where I currently live, and I actually delivered a version of this talk um, at Nerd Night Madison back in November. I've refined it since then. I don't know how many of you read the uh, bio on the websites. I don't know how many of you read that stuff. That's fine if you don't, I'm not gonna judge. But when I said in my bio there that I was a newly minted librarian, I mean, I literally graduated from my master's program in library and information science three days ago. <laughs> Thank you. And promptly hopped on a plane to London for a big old research trip on the woman I am talking to you about today because this is my idea of fun, apparently. This is my graduation present to myself. I'm fantastic at parties. So, all, I also mentioned in my bio, but I can't even have read that, that's fine. I, for about four and a half years, I worked for the digital sheet music company, Music Notes. Is anybody here a customer, perchance? Oh my gosh, one person, I'm so happy, this is great. Um, yeah, I worked for them for a number of years and my two main responsibilities at that company, two most constant responsibilities, were cataloging new products and doing copyright research. I did, this is kind of why I bill myself as a professional music detective. It's a joke, but also not a joke because I did detective work every single day at that job, making sure composers and lyricists could receive proper credit for their songs and sort of indirectly my coworkers in the royalties department were more responsible for this, but proper music royalties. So basically I spent several years in a job that gave me a lot of opportunities to think about music, not necessarily from a theoretical or performance perspective, but music as intellectual property, as people's creative labors that deserved fair and appropriate compensation. So now you might start to understand why when I first discovered Clarabelle during the course of a normal day at that job, actually, and found out that she was one of the first composers ever to receive music royalties. My jaw dropped. You, you, you can probably see why. So for the remainder of this, I'll be referring to speech notes on my phone because I am not yet at the point where I can just go off the cuff and not go off on silly little tangents. All right, so because I would be shocked if more than about, oh gosh, two of you in this room have heard of this woman at all, Here's a Cliff's Notes bio. Clarabelle is the Tennyson-inspired pseudonym of Charlotte Allington Barnard. She had about a 10-year mm, songwriting career. Her first publications under that specific pseudonym went live in about April 1859, and unfortunately she died at age 38 of typhoid fever in January 1869. She was not actually a performer, which is why I sort of qualified what you said. Um, she I have encountered maybe six performances where she actually sang her own songs in periodicals of the time, and they were all for like charitable causes, like in church restoration funds, hospitals for women, things like that. Mostly other people sang her songs. So honestly, a big, I would see big parallels with people like Julia Michaels to working today. The common figure cited for her output by the very few people who have written about her at all is around 100 songs. I have been counting because, frankly, her prior biographer, her sole prior biographer back in the 1960s, did kind of a crap job of counting her total output. So I think it's closer to 110. Still, obviously, subject to change based on further research, as was the case with basically everything I say here. And that's, that is just during her lifetime. That's to say nothing of the approximately 32 songs released by her primary publisher, Boozy & Co., predecessor of Boozy & Hawks, which is still around today, actually, in the four-ish years following her death. I have literally been building a database to keep track of this stuff from scratch. I made it one of my assignments for library school. I have shoehorned this into schoolwork whenever I can. It is not a thesis, though. I'm just obsessed with it. So... Most of her songs were of the genre variously called sentimental or drawing room ballads, basically the kind of music that people would play, you know, after dinner in their homes, things like domestic music making by amateurs rather than trained professionals. This, these were not, at least initially, intended for public entertainment. Keep that in mind. She got 
super duper popular. I, I am one of this woman's two biggest modern day stands. I know the other one. I befriended her on Twitter. We're friends. Hi, Patricia, if you're watching this after the fact. I, even I have continuously underestimated how popular her songs were, especially by the latter half of the 1860s. Her songs were regularly on the program at you know, St. James's Hall, and they were at big musical festival. gosh, sorry, musical festivals in places like Worcester and Gloucester. They were on the programs there. Edward bulwer Lighton, Mr. Dark and Stormy Night himself, was a fan. He wrote her a fan letter. I am not joking. So... I am going, someday I'm going to write the biography this woman deserves. In the meantime, I'm just going to, you know, speak at various nerd nights about it. I should be clear that the music industry was already undergoing some pretty seismic shifts by the time Clarabelle came on the scene. So, and these shifts very much set her up for her runaway success. She didn't invent any of these big innovations herself, although I would still readily call her and her closest associates vanguards of these shifts. They were very much at the forefront of these big paradigm shifts in the music business. So I need to get into a bit of context first before going back to Clarabelle to just show how much the game changed in this relatively short time frame. This is a very brief and oversimplified diagram by me of how music copyright generally worked up until about the mid-1800s, kind of in this in the era immediately preceding Clarabelle's career, a composer created a musical work and they would take it to a publisher. In some cases, the publisher would simply print it and not buy the copyright from the composer. Sometimes they would. It was either all or nothing. The composer often had to straight up sell their work and all intellectual property rights to a music publisher in order for their work to see the light of day. And if they were, you know, particularly well known or had a good sales record, they could get a decent, you know, lump sum payment out of it. More often than not, if they were particularly green or untried, they could maybe just get a few free printed copies of their sheet music for their trouble. They really said, we'll pay you an exposure. So then the publisher, having all of the rights to this thing, could print as much sheet music as they wanted. And to be fair, this was a gamble for publishers because they never ultimately knew what would sell. But if a tune became a massive hit and it sold out every single copy they had, they could just print more and do so, continue to do so at their discretion and publishers would see all the profits from it. Composers wouldn't see anything. So you can see how it would become a pretty raw deal if a composer wrote something that turned out to be a smash hit. I should note that this model hasn't gone away entirely. If you're at all familiar with the concept of work made for hire, that's kind of like this. But very shortly, this would not become not the only model of how intellectual property works in the music arena. So there were, the, I'm, now I'm going to get into these big shifts in how the music business was, haha, -ha, conducted. So one of the big innovations in the late 1850s was that music publishers started to venture into the space of putting on concerts themselves. Previously, that had mainly been the domain of individuals or amateur musical societies, jo or John Ella and the uh, Concert Union, I think was the name of it. Um, but in 1858, St. James Hall opened in Piccadilly. The building no longer stands, but the Piccadilly Hotel is actually on its original site, if you ever want to go to Piccadilly Square and imagine what might have been. And Chapel & Co., which is also still around, it's technically owned by Alfred Publishing Company, sort of kick-started the Monday popular concert. Samuel Arthur Chapel, I think prom primarily known as Arthur, sort of did what I like to call music archaeology. He sort of dug up old like classical works by you know old masters, mostly dead composers, that would never have been heard by these middle-class London audiences before and brought these pieces to these audiences. So that gets at a pretty important distinction that confused me for a while, so I'm explaining it to you. The popular and popular concerts is about the reper the audience, sorry, not the repertoire. So, and that, if actually, if you've been paying attention to Dracula Daily, I don't know if we have any fans of that in here, this concert series, the Monday popular concerts, that's what's referred to in Lucy Westenra's first letter in Dracula, I believe. So that was a pretty big shift. Nobody, at least in my estimation, would follow Chapel until about uh, eight years later. But I'll get to that in a bit. Oh, and one more note. This was really novel. Like, there, were, there was plenty of music people hadn't heard or would have had no reason to hear 
because recorded sound wasn't a thing yet. Edison wouldn't even invent the phonograph until 1877, so if you wanted to hear music, you had to either play it yourself or hear people play it. So this actually did a lot to bring a lot more music, a lot more diversity of music to popular audiences. Another big change was exclusive contracts. These are kind of du jour for musicians today, but they were not very common in the mid-Victorian era. I can, Claire Bell's closest peer, a woman named Virginia Gabriel, is kind of an example of how a lot of musicians conducted business in this day. She had, I think, songs with over like 10 or 12 publishers at least. That was, that was very common. Ex exclusivity was a lot less common. Also of note, Maria Lidzi was apparently the first woman to have an exclusive music publishing contract with Robert Cox and co. Yes, I know you may titter for two seconds while I change the slide. Um, royalties was the biggest change in this era and definitely the most debated in the press, which I will also get to soon. Apparently, composers on the continent had been finagling royalties from their publishers for, since about the 1840s, but when a royalty system first came to England, it actually looked more like influencers than anything, which is why I spent 10 minutes of my life, a year and a half ago at this point, photoshopping this fake Instagram post to prove my point. I make great life choices. So how this worked basically was singers would agree to introduce a song and perform it in public, maybe at a set number of public engagements. I'm not sure about the details. Point being, they could receive you know, either a lump sum payment for it. Um, Charlotte St. and Dolby's terms were apparently 10 guineas for that, according to a letter I've found on a you know, manuscript auction house. Or what they could also do was take a percentage of gross sales of each unit of sheet music sold, and if they did so, their royalty signature, usually just their initials, would be on the cover of each piece of sheet music. So you can, I don't know how well, especially you folks in the back can see, but the, oh, this is really pixelated on the screen, sorry, but the cover of the sheet music in the middle of the screen here says, sung by Madame Saint and Dolby, implying that, you know, Charlotte St. Dolby is a singer associated with the song who maybe introduced it. And CHSD are her initials. This is for Charlotte Helen St. Dolby. So she would get eh, roughly four pence for every copy of the song sold. And normally in the early 1860s, these songs would go for about two and a half to three shillings. Prices generally went up in the latter half of the 1860s to three or four shillings a pop. Um, gosh, let me scroll. Um, so... Plenty of the sort of singing luminaries of the 1860s introduced Clarabelle's songs in some form and sang them at various concerts, often participating in the royalty system. But Clarabelle also got royalties from a lot of her songs, like I mentioned briefly earlier. Her main publisher, John Boozy, who I'll talk more about in a second, seems to have been the first music publisher in England to extend royalties to composers as well as performers. And Clarabelle was the first composer on his roster to have a royalty arrangement. So that is one major reason why her career is super notable in terms of the history of music as a business. It was notable in a lot of respects, actually. Um, to point out something unrelated to any of the previous topics, I just made a pretty graph for this and I wanted to show it off. She actually often wrote the music and lyrics to her songs for about, about oh gosh, the text boxes got all out of order. Anyway, she, by my count, and I have been counting, she wrote the music and lyrics to a little under half her songs. That wasn't necessarily unique in this era, but certainly uncommon. More often you'd get composers setting existing poetry to songs, which is why you have a billion sheet music versions of Albert Tennyson's The Brook around. So, and most of her songs were also under one publisher, first Boozy and Sons, then Boozy and Co. as of about October 1864. John Boozy, the head honcho, saw something special in Clarabelle songs pretty early on, and he actually bought some Clarabelle copyrights from other publishers. Her first big hit, Janet's Choice, which the cover was on, a, on the slideshow a few slides back, was published by Emery around April 50, 1859, but in March 1860, Boozy started advertising it under that firm's auspices. And by my reckoning, he bought about eight Clarabelle songs from other publishers over the 1860s outside of copyright auctions. Music copyright auctions were hardly uncommon in this era, but I've had a look at the records of Puttick and Simpsons, which conducted most of these auctions. These specific songs that I know changed hands are nowhere to be seen. So. Likely, he was specifically seeking them out, and doesn't that speak volumes about his business strategy? 
Boozy also extended an exclusive contract to Clarabelle. As of about 1863, she was getting paid 300 pounds a year, which I think is a little just, just a little shy of 18,000 pounds today, according to the National Archives currency converter, just to write a bunch of songs for exclusive publication by Boozy & Co. That's a freaking lot of money. I know I'm jealous. So, and all this was a gamble, but I think it ultimately paid off. Janet's Choice saw, was in his 20th print run by 1865 and then I would say most of her songs saw upwards of like four or five print runs some even over 20 print runs so people were buying her music people really liked her music so why was that oh gosh there's a bit I forgot to take out in this outline okay so she wrote for her audience very very well drawing room ballads were meant to be learned easily and sound good quickly. Like they were not virtuoso pieces. They were meant for you to, you know, take a look at and figure out in a short period of time so that you could, you know, in due course, entertain people in the drawing room after dinner. They weren't supposed to be complicated. And the, I don't know a ton about music theory, but the piano accompaniments for her songs seem very well suited to this particular audience, the, a natural fit for the drawing room. Um, so like I've said, these were not originally intended for concert hall performances, but, and I've talked a lot about John Boozy's business strategy, but I also cannot overstate the role that Charlotte St. and Dolby played. She saw Clarabelle's potential before even Boozy did, I think. She, in about January 1860, she bought Janet's Choice, which again you saw earlier, as a royalty tune, as kind of another name for this genre that emerged in this decade, the quote unquote royalty ballad. Um, and I couldn't count I will count someday, but I couldn't count now how many times she performed that specific song over the ensuing decade. Um, and she was already a well-established singer by this point. I think she had just turned 40 by the time 1860 rolled around. So, and this, this gal literally impressed Felix Mendelssohn so much that he wrote the alto part in the Elijah Oratorio for her voice. That's how good she was. And this woman was the one to quite literally bring Clarabelle's music out of the drawing room and to larger audiences, to ever more public and ever more professional concerts. In fact, I don't think it would be a stretch to suggest that Clarabelle's sheer levels of success and the sort of obvious public demand for her ballads that it evinced, that kind of gave St. Adolby and Boozy the sort of joint idea that they had for ballad concerts. These shindigs weren't 100% ballads, mind you, but the genre was still the focus in a way it hadn't really been before. So St. Dolby and her violinist husband, Prosper St. put on the first official ballad concert in January 1866. It was the first in a series of like three or four, I don't know quite how many. Um, and the reviews were largely great. She proceeded to spend most of the rest of 1866 touring the provinces with that same sort of concert fair. And in the meantime, holy crap, Ballad concerts were suddenly absolutely everywhere. And the, the Crystal Palace had a whole series of them in, in summer and fall of 1866. They got Sims Reeves on the bill for that. And people who had already given plenty of concerts were suddenly specifically calling them ballad concerts. Um, Alfred Mellon and Edwin Bransford are the two names I'm thinking of on the slide. People who did that, who were already giving plenty of concerts, and were suddenly like, oh, no, oh, ballad concerts are kind of profitable. We should probably bill them as that. I don't know yet whether the repertoire for all these other concerts was the much vaunted good old English ballads or modern music. I hope I, I hope I can find that out. We'll see. All told, these concerts were generally well received enough that at the end of March 1867, John Boozy sort of followed in Chapel's footsteps from about eight years earlier and announced the first official Boozy produced ballad concerts. Clarabelle was almost always on the program in some form for gosh, probably 25 years after these kicked off, and several of her songs were actually premiered specifically at these things, which were variously known as the London Ballad Concerts or the Boozy Ballad Concerts, probably depending on which magazines you were reading. And despite some bitchy naysayers in the press, these things outlived everybody involved in their creation. I think the last one took place in 1933. That lasted the First World War. That's pretty huge. They really created something special there. 
And now, a brief American interlude. I have not been able to research this part of the story as much yet, but I'd feel weird not mentioning it because Americans loved Clarabelle's music so much. Like, in part, um, there was a lot of music piracy involved, or technically, I guess it wasn't music piracy because there wasn't a law that would make that a crime yet. Um, I don't think the first international copyright treaty between the US and Britain came into being until about 1890. So until then, people like Oliver Ditson out in Boston could just sort of import English songs just indiscriminately and suffer basically no consequence that I know of. And the, Ditson was industrious too. Her, um, I think the first song I've seen advertised in an American periodical was Dreamland, which was released in June 1860. And that advertisement I saw it in was from the Boston Daily Advertiser in September 1860. That was a pretty quick turnaround. And the other major factor in her American popularity was, I swear to God, I keep meaning to look up how to pronounce this woman's name and it hasn't happened yet. Euphrosyne Parepa? Something like that. Anyway, she was another operatic powerhouse who often introduced Clarabelle's songs in this era. And she went on tour with her, I think, future then husband, Carl Rosa, in around 1867, in what was known as the Bateman Concerts, named after their organizer, whose first name I cannot remember and don't care about, frankly, at the moment. And she specifically got rapturous reviews for her rendition of Clarabelle's song, Five O'Clock in the Morning. Like, people were just beside themselves with how much they loved this stuff. So this is an angle I need to investigate a lot more because there's so much more to it. Um, but now I'm going to get to a part that I'm sure you all will realize, oh my god, why didn't you get to this earlier? People were so mean in the British press. Like, this is just a sampling of the absolute, like, you know, Twitter-level bitchiness that people were just printing just indiscriminately, seemingly. And there's, there, there's even more. There's, you know, pernicious, infliction, nuisance. And one of my favorites that somehow I didn't find a screenshot for in time was um, the utmost insanity of nonsense to ever insult the human ear. <laughs> like, no freaking filter here. I mean, hell, one music critic even invented a word. In May 1866, Henry Fothergill Chorley, longtime music critic for the Athenaeum and certifiable Grumpy Gills, coined the term... Clarabelle wear to refer to the whole genre of sentimental ballads, drawing room ballads. She, she became the face of the genre. Not John Boozy, not Charlotte St. John Dolby, Clarabelle. And what's wild is like 90% of, maybe not 90, a lot of this hate was coming from like two newspapers mainly. The orchestra was memorably described by the spectator as an occasionally clever and generally abusive musical paper. <laughs> They're responsible for every instance of trash Along, as, along with some of the more creative insults. But even the Athenaeum, which was generally more measured, became even more vehement as you know, the latter half of the 1860s rolled on. So like, people still liked Clarabelle's music for the most part. They bought it, they showed up to ballad concerts. And the, but the small contingent of opinionated men still had a large impact, probably most of all on Clarabelle herself, who got so stressed at the media furor that it quite literally made her ill. So that begs the question, what the hell did she do to merit any of this? It is not just because she was a woman, surprisingly. They're, they're, I mean, kind of, yes. But also, there were plenty of other factors involved. Um, one factor was well, certainly her anonymity, the fact that people could you know, complain about like, sort of a faceless avatar instead of a real person with a real social reputation. On a more fundamental level, it has a lot to do with genre. Clarabelle's music and a lot of these sentimental ballads in general centered women's choices and emotions, which might not have been so much of a problem if they had just stayed in the damn domestic sphere, but instead they were being sung and encored at public concerts in the public sphere. And I feel like a lot of this melodrama was basically these you know, opinionated um, men in the press going, yeah, cuties, girls, get that away from me. The royalty system was also a huge source of debate. People were legitimately arguing that it was immoral for composers and performers to accept royalties, that anyone who did so was doing a grievous injury to art, um, which also feeds into point six I have, um, the gullibility of masses. Apparently, like these same people believed, oh, the public is like not going to you know, have good taste on their own. Any performers have sort of a duty to sing good music for them and shepherd them towards good taste. 
probably the other biggest factor besides gender was I'm, I'm sure some of you all have heard of England described as Das Land ohne Musik. I deeply apologize to my German grandfather for probably butchering that pronunciation. That essay, the essay that's from did not actually appear until 1904, but the perception that England was unmusical, I'm still tracing the exact genesis of it, but it was definitely around in the 1860s and absolutely part of this debate on, you know, oh, is Clarabelle actually trash? Our sentimental bow is just worthless and, you know, should never be printed ever again. Um, and all these cultural critics in the press and in the academy, both in this time and beyond, were just scrabbling for an authentically English music, but in a way that was so hyper-specific. They were like, oh, we have to have an English composer of classical music specifically. That cut out a huge swath of English musical life. There were, uh, there were so many concerts in London alone that you, you could, probably couldn't throw a stone without hitting a concert hall. People loved making music and listening to other people make music in this era. And apparently that wasn't English enough. I don't know. Um, so I'll be brief about this last part. The last year of Clarabelle's life was unfortunately kind of a shitstorm. Um, She'd been stressing herself sick about the media vitriol. I could do a whole other Nerd Night presentation about the time she um, and her husband as her sort of legal representative sued another music publisher for what essentially constituted trademark infringement before trademark infringement was really kind of a crime that you could do, sort of. That, that's a whole other tangent that I don't have time to go on. Um, then in summer 1868, her father, Henry Ellington Pye, supposedly an upstanding citizen in their hometown of Louth, Lincolnshire, Turned out he'd been embezzling money from the county treasury for like years and was in like $30 million of debt. And somehow Clarabelle ended up being the head of operation. Let's keep dad out of prison. Um, she and her husband forked over like what amounted to $4 million today to try to settle some of the de his debts. And the whole family, Henry's second wife, Clarabelle's much younger half-sister, Clarabelle and her husband, all fled to Belgium so Henry wouldn't get his ass thrown in prison. Um, and she, poor girl, was doing a lot of emotional labor to try to manage her dad. My heart hurt when I read that passage in her, again, one biography written so far. And then all this came to an end in January 1869 when she contracted typhoid fever on a voyage from Belgium to Dover and died, unfortunately. And her career, her legacy was debated so intensely in the press after her passing and even even the more sort of like you know even-handed balanced retrospectives could only just damn her with faint praise like this um better music will certainly not take its place in the drawing rooms till a more earnest and real method of teaching the arts will supersede the present system of veneering over the female mind with a thin and polished surface of apparent musical knowledge. That was the best they could freaking do by her. Th that was the best anybody could do. But Clarabelle still made a huge impact on the business and culture of music in this relatively short amount of time. I hope I've shown that pretty well with this presentation, but because I don't want to end with a total downer, I'll close with this. I think she may have asserted her song's value herself in an anonymous letter to the editor of the orchestra published in March 1867. The title of these last couple slides is also the title under which this letter was printed. I'm not going to reproduce the whole thing or read the whole thing for the sake of time, but the letter as a whole is this absolute deadpan mockery of this one guy called Dr. George French Flowers, who had a lot of weird opinions about music ability, especially as it related to anatomy. It's, it's very bizarre. But here's the important part. Um, now to the great subject of my letter. Mm, shit's going wrong. If a poor woman suffers under an imperfect cochlea, like I said, weird opinions about physiology, how comes it to pass she can compose this popular music and sing this music so as to please the public? Here is poor feminine Clarabelle with her hundred songs hoarding up a respectable sum from a four-penny royalty and poor Madame St. and Dolby industriously singing Cla poor Clarabelle's imperfections in all quarters at the same time making an equally respectable four-penny treasure. What says Dr. Flowers? Are Clarabelle's songs very sweet music, or are they not? Now, my suspicions as to the letter writer's identity are mainly founded on the second sentence in which she says she is a clergyman's wife, as was Clarabelle. I can't say for sure yet. If she did write this letter, then what a clapback. Oh my god, I really hope she did. But even if she didn't, it is still a frank assertion of the very real value that Clarabelle's songs 
and the performances from people like Charlotte Saints and Dilby, like Helen Lemons Sherrington and, and others held to the English public. And that still absolutely matters. Thank you so much. If you want more Victorian years of musical shenanigans, I have a link tree with a research newsletter that I swear to God I'm going to update someday. Um, prior conference papers, the, my presence on the bird site, which is still somehow a thing, et cetera, et cetera. So I also have a few business cards with the QR code on them. If you want one, just find me after the program. So yeah, I will call it good there. Thank you so much. Massive round of applause. <laughs> Who here has already forgotten the name of the shitty critic? <laughs> yeah, who remembers there's, her name? There's a lot to forget. <laughs> uh, any questions? Do we have any questions? There is one. Um, when you spoke about um, Ditson mm -hmm. and like, the Americans taking the music for yes. the thing, thing, do we know um, how both the UK publishers and Clara Barr her, herself felt about that at the time, if it took 30 years? for there to be some sort of treaty. Was that due to like pushback from, say, the US government, or was it just they didn't care for a while and they realized they could get another? That's a really good question. The question was about Ditson, the pirating American music publisher, and you know how, if any way, Boozy and Clarabelle felt about their music being pirated, like how people felt in general, things like that. I'm not entirely certain that they knew like that a crap load of English music was being sort of imported into the Americas, and even if they're they knew there wasn't much they could do about it, honestly. Um, honestly, copyright law in general, the history of copyright law is a giant mess, and it is one of those things I'm still trying to get to grips with. It involves a lot of reading like legal papers and sort of deconstructing legalese. So I don't have a more definitive answer yet, but it's one of those things I'm trying to understand, like why it took so long for what feel nowadays like sort of common sense innovations, like, you know, Yes, we want to make sure that intellectual property is protected around the world, not just in this single country or whatever. I don't know why it took so long for that to happen. I think a huge part of the problem is that the definition of intellectual property has always been incredibly slippery. People have always had trouble getting to grips with what exactly it is, let alone you know how exactly to protect it, what, you know, I feel like the history of IP legislation is like, oh, we'll pass a law, you know, providing for these specific things, forbidding these specific things, and then it's, it's like if you QA a software program, immediately like a gazillion things you didn't think of pop up and prove to be issues, and you're like, oh my god, we gotta go through this entire legislative rigmarole again? Because I didn't think of these like 50 gazillion things the first time? Oh my god. So, this wasn't the only arena in which piracy was an issue. I don't know a ton about this, but Charles Dickens actually had a huge battle with American publishers who were sort of pirating his work during his lifetime, which is actually in this, I think it occurred in this same decade even. So this is a whole big thorny issue that took a whole lot of people and a whole lot of time to resolve. And in the meantime, you know, people who got their stuff pirated transatlantically were still kind of screwed. They couldn't really, there was no real recourse for them as far as I know. I've been thinking about this question a lot. I'm sorry. The question was, is there anybody I can point to in the modern day as sort of like an equivalent to Clarabelle? I have actually thought about this a lot, and I'm so glad you asked that. I did. This, this wasn't even a plant. Um, I, I mentioned Julia Michaels earlier, and she'd historically been mainly a songwriter and just sort of recently in the last like few years or so ventured into performing herself. So I, I see a lot of parallels with her. I would also think that if Clarabelle lived in the modern day, she might have started out as a YouTuber, kind of like Dodie, honestly. So she just posted some videos, just sing, actually singing her own songs, um, maybe with some sort of weird internet anonymity veil, but stuff would have blown up from there. Incidentally, I, in my first graduate program, I was a research assistant to a professor um, looking into the post-war career of Vera Lynn, who I'm sure at least some of you all have heard of, and a lot of the music that Vera Lynn performed was in the easy listening genre. And I really, truly think that if Clarabelle had lived just like 80 years later, 
she would have ended up writing songs for Vera Lynn and other people like Petula Clark, people, folks like that. Yeah, are there like any recordings or like modern editions of the songs? Because like as you were talking about this, I was kind of like, what are they like? Like, and I wonder if I would like them as a modern person. Yeah, of course. The question was, are there any sort of modern day recordings or performances of her songs? Some. The she kind of got screwed by you know recorded sound not having really been invented in her era, but. John McCormick, the Irish tenor, actually sort of single-handedly made one of, gave one of her songs, Come Back to Erin, sort of a faux Irish ballad that I actually didn't even mention in this thing for time, sort of a new life, and his recording of it is sort of the canonical version, I guess you could call it, so you can, you can find that on the internet archive, and as well as various places on YouTube. I would say Maureen O'Hara's performance of Come Back to Erin on, oh gosh, I don't remember which mid-century TV show it was. That is, I believe, in one of the original keys, and I think it would have been the closest to what concert goers in the 1860s experienced. As far as actual modern day versions of her songs, I briefly shouted out Patricia Hammond earlier. I cannot recommend this woman's book enough. She wrote a very slim volume, very easy read, called She Wrote the Songs, Unsung Women of Sheet Music. And she talks about a lot of people in the book, not just Clara Bell, but what's really special about that book is Patricia is also a trained singer. I think she's a mezzo and she wrote, recorded a CD to go with the book, and she has done recordings of several of Clara Bell's songs, and that is on Spotify, and you can also buy the physical CD on her website, I think. So, and she's really concerned with like authenticity in performance of historical songs, so I would really recommend checking out her work if you want to get a good idea of like how those songs would have been originally performed. Of course. Any more questions? There's one. I have a follow-up. Do you actually enjoy it if you, if you listen to it, like the musical value? I mo the, oh, sorry, the question was, do I actually enjoy Claire Bell songs? It's funny because I got asked this at the last nerd night I presented at, too. I mostly enjoy them, but I will say another thing that is not necessarily her fault is she lived and wrote her songs in the era before Song Bridges were a thing. I'm still trying to figure out when those actually came about. I think it was the early 1900s, kind of with Tin Pan Alley, um, some, something like that. I'm not super clear on that history. As a result, like her songs do tend to kind of sound a little bit samey because it's the sort of verse refrain form usually repeated about three times and then that's it. There's no sort of, you know, change in the middle to, you know, break things up for the sake of interest. So, they do come across as a little dated in that respect, but again, that's not, necess that's not her fault. Like everybody else in that time period who wrote popular music, and there were a lot of them, was doing the same thing. So I'm, I would not hold that against her. And frankly, in this era, there's also the idea that a good performer can make even the worst song sound good. And that's usually um, the context in which I've usually seen it is people trashing Clara Bob saying, oh, but Charlotte Santa Dolby made this song sound good, even though it's, you know, you know what I mean. But I do think the principle kind of applies to singing in general. Like, if you sing a song and really mean it and really focus on, like, giving it that underlying conviction, I think would be the word I would use, like, it's still going to sound good because... It comes from a really genuine place. At least that's, I'm kind of parroting Patricia again there because that's something she's said to me like a zillion times about it and I totally believe her there. So, yeah. We have time for one more. Is there another one? No. In that case, thank you very much.